The grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone, and a very good Easter to each and every one of you, wherever you are in the, in the world or in the community you're looking in on what is perhaps the high point of the whole Christian year, the celebration of Jesus' resurrection and what that means for us in this moment. And it's good for us, whatever our circumstances, however we're feeling this particular morning, that we can be sure of the Lord's presence with us. I'm constantly taken back to an image of the Apostle Paul at the end of his life and under great pressure, recalling a moment when he had to appear before the authorities to give an account of his faith and his witness. He found it difficult, but he said, the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. That's what the resurrection means for us in this moment. And I'm praying that the worship that we'll be involved in at this moment will be strong in the presence of our risen Lord. So let's worship God now. As we sing together, we sing the praise of him who died. the psalmist can lead us in a note of celebration on this Easter Sunday when he says, Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let us pray. 
God, our Father, we join our hearts to praise the risen Lord who with you created the universe, who with you sustains the universe, with you has it in his heart to renew the universe. The Lord who is present in every moment, who knows when every sparrow falls, who has counted every hair, who has clothed every flower. We stand in awe before our God and know that in his height, his depth, his breadth, there is too much for our minds to grasp. But still, by his grace, connection is possible through his Son, who comes to us as an unborn child, as a cradled baby, as a questioning adolescent, as a carpenter's son, as a preacher and healer, as an executed criminal. The one who says to us, he, has, he who has seen me has seen the Father. The Father in the days of celebration, in the days of challenge, the days of grief and suffering, the days of triumph over the darkness. The Father with us from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. The Father with us now, revealed by the Son, brought near by the Holy Spirit. The one who is with us to bless us with his forgiveness, his strength, his peace. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's read together now in God's Word, friends, as we turn to the Gospel according to John at chapter 3 and at verse 16. John chapter 3 and at verse 16, where we read these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And God will bless to us the reading of his Word and to his name be glory and praise. We sing together now, O oh, to see the dawn.
Let us pray. God, our Father, we remember that on the evening of the first Easter, two followers of Jesus encountered the risen Lord who took them through the scriptures to help them to understand that this Messiah had to die and to rise again. And as he spoke, they felt their hearts burning within them. And so we pray that through your word spoken on this Easter day, that we would experience the presence of our risen Lord and that by his grace we may be taken forward in the life of faith so that we might be true witnesses to the resurrection. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it's been a considerable blessing during this Lenten season to be joining with others on a Saturday morning for half an hour and to be focusing on a verse, just one verse of Scripture. Myself and elders in the congregation have been seeking to focus on certain aspects of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, many people have said that that one verse really encapsulates the, the whole gospel, that it lays out for us what is God's great project to renew the whole of creation and to make it fit for a renewed people to live in and to enjoy. We're still being horrified, distressed with the images that are coming to us from Ukraine, particularly when we see people standing in the ruins of their villages and their towns, all their possessions gone, perhaps nursing personal injuries, physical and mental. And the question comes into your mind, what is it going to take once, God willing, this conflict has, has passed? What is it going to take to rebuild and to renew this country? It's going to take some of the best minds and the most committed workers in order to once again shape the future of that nation. And God, we are told in Scripture, he looked at the ruins of his creation. He responded to what had happened to his creation, and in particular, the humanity that reflected his image. And he responded to this. He responded to the, to the ruins. He responded in love, and he also was willing to respond and to pay a considerable cost. He loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. God saw what had happened when humanity turned its back on him and opened up the way for death, decay and, and disobedience to be part of, of human experience. But still he reached out and he reached out in love and in power to the devastation that had been caused. And this is something that we need to bear in mind whenever we're talking about mission. So often it's a, a question of plans and techniques, strategies. But it begins with God, true mission. And if we are seeking to reach out to the world with the message 
of salvation, if we're seeking to, to respond to the need of the world out of our love, then we are connecting with the very being of God. True mission is an extension of the love and the power of our God. It has to begin with him. And that's why it's so important for us when we're looking at John 3.16 that the first word there is God. God and his love. This is what impelled his commitment to renew the creation and the humanity that had been spoiled. We remember that in the beginning of all things, as it's recounted to us in the book of Genesis, God took great pleasure in everything that he had created. At every stage of the creation, we're told that God saw that it was good, that from within himself, there was this glow of satisfaction in, in everything that he had done. And even more so, when he saw the humanity that was destined to reflect his being, he saw that all of it was good. But then the experience of humanity that had absolutely everything soured, because they wanted more than what God could give. And so denial, disobedience came into creation. There was a fall away from God. There was a hardening of, of hearts. And that's when death and decay came into creation. That's when sin became a barrier against God. I wonder if you can imagine some great work of art, something that gives enormous pleasure, something that is overflowing with, with meaning and purpose. And along comes somebody with a spray can and, and, and sprays obscenities all over this wonderful piece of art. How would the artist feel? This is giving us some insight into how God felt in the ruins of his creation. But we're told that even in that very moment, he gave a glimpse of what his purpose was. And it was to, to renew his creation and to restore humanity in the fullness of a relationship. And so through the history of Israel, there was the law. And through the history of Israel, there were the prophets seeking to, to bring people back to God. But in the fullness of time, there was the fullest expression of God seeking to save. And that was focused on his son. God loved the world so much that he gave his son. And that shows us the, the, the extent of God's love for us. It shows us the depth of God's love for us, the, 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 the power of, of God's love seeking to touch us in the depths of our being because we're told that, that God held nothing back in order to bring humanity back to himself. God loved the world so much that he gave his son. Now, whenever we think of our giving, whether it's time, whether it's energy, whether it's our talents, whether it's money, there has to be some calculation involved. We only have so much that we can give. But what we're told is that God gave everything. He gave the one who shared his very being. That is the extent 
of God's love for us. When I was having my stem cells harvested for the transplant, I was in the same room as a lady who had traveled all the way from, from Dumfries and was having her stem cells harvest, harvested for the benefit of her brother who was suffering from leukemia. She was holding nothing back out of her love. She was doing everything that she possibly could for the sake of her brother. Reflecting in some way the love of God who gave absolutely everything. Who gave his entire being that humanity could be brought back to himself, that creation could be renewed. And we have to bring this down to a, an individual level. The, the verse says, God so loved the world, and that's a kind of general term. But the verse also refers to whoever believes. And there we're talking about individuals. The love of God for each individual who is listening to this this morning. God believing that each one of you is worthy of the death of his son. No wonder Wesley has us sing, Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? But that's where the gospel connects with each one of us on this Easter morning. Each one of us worthy of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and coming into the promises of the risen Lord. For many years now I've been connected with the Precial Trust in, in Govan, which exists to show that each individual, no matter what their experiences have been in the past, each individual is precious in the eyes of God. That's what precial means in Gaelic. Precious. And that is where we stand on this Easter morning. God cherishing in his heart this greatest of all loves and it falls on us as individuals. But we're not finished even there because we're told that whoever believes in the Son will have eternal life. Will not perish but have eternal life. Now whenever that phrase appears in the Gospels, what we're talking about there is, is the, the eternal kingdom of God, which the people, people of Israel believed would come at the end of God's great plan for, for all things, the, the, the perfect kingdom upon which no shadow of suffering, pain, or tears would ever fall. But it also refers to those who will inhabit this kingdom, this kingdom will be, will be fashioned for a redeemed people, a renewed people to live in. You know, we, we can reflect on the fragility of our own lives and the, the psalmist does this continually. And in Psalm 103, he reflects upon the fact that in the, in the vast march of time and from the perspective of human history we're all here today and gone tomorrow we're like flowers in the field we flourish one minute and then in the next we have withered and died and the ground where the flower has has grown remembers the flower no more but then he takes us to a higher level when he says from everlasting to everlasting the lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. 
with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And then there is this great enjoinder to each one of us to, to keep company with the angels in heaven, to praise the Lord, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. There is a kingdom of God. Even as we grow and flourish and then wither and die, there is eternal life. God has planned this kingdom and he has planned for his people to inhabit this kingdom. Eternal life, friends, is where we are going. In the midst of all the fragility that we personally experience, in the midst of all the tragedy that we see in the world, that promise stands. That God is working through all to establish his kingdom and to ensure that his people have a place in it. So there is a, a future. There is a future. And we know about this future because of Easter morning. When Jesus emerged from the darkness of the tomb, the darkness of death itself, when he, through all the sufferings that he endured, stood before those who were closest to him, renewed in, in body, in mind and in spirit, holding out a promise not only to those who were closest to him, but to the whole world, that this was their destiny, to be like him. The firstborn of many brothers, says the Apostle Paul, the elder brother in God's family, the prototype of the new humanity who would enjoy the new kingdom. That is where we are going this morning, friends, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you that our risen Lord has called us aside to inspire our love, to reveal our gifts, to enable us to serve wholeheartedly. We thank you for the assurance that there is a place for all of us in the great plan, which will climax in the coming of your kingdom. We thank you for the bond we have with men and women who have heard the call and who walk with us, sharing our burdens and inspiring our service. We thank you for the bond we have with those who have fought the good fight, who have finished the race, who have kept the faith, and now enjoy the crown of righteousness. And we pray that as we go forward in this life of faith, we would hold in our hearts our fellow Christians throughout the world who live to tell the story of Jesus and share his love with those in need. We hold in our hearts the nations of the world under pressure due to hunger, drought, homelessness, war, and strained resources as the struggle against COVID-19 continues. And we hold in our own hearts today our own nation especially those elected in the parliaments of Scotland and the United Kingdom, as they prepare for the challenges ahead. And we hold in our hearts neighbours, friends, family members, those who face challenges due to ill health, due to uncertainty at work, due to bereavement, 
due to faltering faith. We pray, O Lord, that you would hold each one of them in your heart and enable them to know the renewing presence of the risen Lord. All these prayers we offer in his name and ask that by your grace we would know his presence even now as we say together his prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Now may you go in peace, for Christ the risen Lord goes before you. Go where he calls, and as you go, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.